On behalf of Passive House Accelerator and our stakeholder partner, NYSERDA, the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, welcome to Reimagine Buildings Electrification. So today I'd like to share with everyone here an overview of how our team is providing an all electric building using, using a ground source or geothermal system for this 28 story new construction affordable senior housing building in Harlem that's aiming to start construction at the end of this year. This project is a NYSERDA Buildings of Excellence early design support winner from the third round and a demonstration project from the fourth. The BOE early design support gave us the ability to prove out the viability for decarbonization and other regenerative concepts for this specific project, which then greatly strengthened the application for our BOE, BOE demonstration award in the next round. We are using lessons learned from our early phase study and our demonstration projects to inform our full portfolio. The early design support program directs funding to approved design firms to strengthen their capacity to create carbon neutral projects specifically targeting impact across entire portfolios rather than individual projects. So as we saw earlier, the full electrification is a fundamental element in our industry's climate action approach as outlined here by the Passive House Accelerator and Reimagine Buildings. In New York, we are addressing each one of these components of the climate action equation by shaping our construction industry with sensible guardrails and achievable goals. In New York City specifically, Local Law 154 sets emissions limits on site, which essentially equates to an all building, all building systems electrification requirement with the emergency generator notably excluded. Also, our city and state housing agencies now require that all new construction be fully electric. In addition to climate action, MAP's focus on sustainability is broad, aiming to take advantage of mutually reinforcing strategies and reaching for regeneration. Our BOE early phase study focused on these highlighted aspects, and today I'm sharing with you the results from the ground source heat pump portion of our study and how we implemented it on the project. This Carmen Viegas project is a cast in place building with a small footprint that sits directly south of an existing building on the same lot. And you can see it's also a dir directly adjacent to the elevated train. So before we discuss the ground source system, it's probably no surprise to this audience and so far we've heard that I will emphasize the recommendation for efficiency first. As a, any fully electric building will benefit uh, tremendously from a sensible investment in quality control, thermal bridge mitigation, and the right amount of insulation. And so this building is going for FIAS 2021 core certification. Making sure your loads are reliably low, which is achieved with Passive House, is one of the best tools to ensure your mechanical systems are not oversized, that they will perform well, and that you can avoid spikes in energy use throughout the year. Here are our FIAS energy modeling results showing we're on track for certification. As many here likely know, passive house multifamily buildings in our climate are typically cooling demand dominated. This is a great match with geothermal systems because the domestic hot water load then becomes a place to, to use that excess heat from a cooling system to keep the ground temperatures in balance. And I'll explain a bit more of that coming up. This is a high level quick graphic of a ground source system. We are using the ground as a stable thermal battery from which we can pull or reject heat. With heat pump electrification technology, we are not generating heat like combustion equipment does. We are just moving heat around. And therefore it is far more efficient than fossil fuel systems will ever be. Right now, geothermal is at least four times more efficient. The water loop running through the vertical bore field underground is closed so that all that's exchanged with the earth is heat. The bore field loop enters a central manifold at the base of the building, which then connects to the heat pumps to make, to make the domestic hot water and connects to the water loop circulating within the building. Along the building loop, each apartment has its own heat pump which uses the water medium to pull or reject heat and heat or cool their space. The only energy to the system is electricity, which powers the pumps, circulates the water in the borehole loops, powers the heat exchangers and the individual apartment heat pumps. 
There are no on-site greenhouse gas emissions or pollution, such as particulate matter or ozone. Taking a closer look at the apartment, the water source heat pump, as shown here in red, sends conditioned air into the living room and the bedroom. It's placed at the facade because engineers often place heating and cooling sources at exterior walls, where the effects of heat loss or gain are most perceived. But I believe it's not quite necessary in a passive house, but for this project, it likely needs um, further study. It's important to note that the heating and cooling system is entirely separate from the ventilation system. This is provided with a central ERV on the roof, connected to the ductwork in the apartment as shown here. For architects, when coordinating, co coordinating with your MEP engineer, it's helpful to keep these two functions separate conceptually. Sometimes you can combine them as we've seen, but it's rare in our typology um, for economical passive house multifamily projects of this size. It's helpful when exploring options just for, your, for to remember as an architect, you need to solve both ventilation and space conditioning. The unit in the apartment typically has the component shown here. It's a simple heat pump that's drawing or rejecting heat from the building's water loop. And, an, and, a, and then a fan uh, blows air over the heated or cooled coils into the space. The floor area needed is about three square feet and all that's visible in the unit is a return air grill and a supply grill. And there are no openings needed in the facade. This project's typical apartment unit size is about 10,000 BTUs and has a COP of 4.1 and an EER, its efficiency for cooling, at 18.5. More recently, manufacturers are making these type of water source heat pumps with variable speed compressors, which gives them a boost of about 20% efficiency and also helps them more effectively dehumidify in cooling modes, which is extremely important in a passive house multifamily building. Before you proceed to select a ground source system, it's important to confirm the type of ground material you're working with to determine its thermal conductivity. Fortunately, this project is in Manhattan and Manhattan Schist has great thermal conductivity. Each borehole in the ground loop will be about 800 feet deep. New York State just relaxed its regulations on how deep these can be. It used to be 500 feet. The building's footprint is actually quite small, shown here in Cyan, compared to its height and occupancy. The tax lot shown in red is, is shown in red, but the full project lot includes the purple area next to the existing building to the north. The exact size of the bore field is still being worked out, but the entire site, all the areas in color here, can carry about 30 of them and will likely need about 22 to 24. They need to be placed about 20 feet apart. So if we did not have some area outside of the building's footprint, we may not have had enough thermal capacity. And if this building was not a passive house, we most certainly would not have had enough. When designing the supportive excavation and foundation for your building, the sequencing of the bore field drilling should be carefully coordinated. This site has some particular constraints noted here that required close collaboration. It's important that the bore field be sized to keep the ground in balance. So in other words, we do not wanna be taking out or putting in too much heat so that the stable ground temperature under the building does not shift over time. This is because the equipment inside the building is designed to operate at peak efficiency within a certain temperature range. So I mentioned earlier that it's great our building is cooling demand dominated, which means we have excess heat to make hot water. But in fact, we have even more excess heat in our building that can be absorbed by the hot water demand, and we will have even more so as the climate warms. We are in danger then of changing the ground temperature underneath our building and overheating, so we need to find a way to expel that excess heat. One way to handle this is to oversize the bore field so you have more area to work with, but that can get expensive. Another way is to connect to a neighbor that needs the excess heat in the summertime, but there is no use of that, uh, that uh, nearby and it, perhaps that's a bit too innovative at the moment. We could eject some heat into the sewer, but that equipment is expensive and maybe not the best environmentally. The most cost-effective option is to expel the extra heat into the air, and this is easily done with a dry cooler on the roof. It runs only when truly needed and straightforwardly provides a buffer on the system. It's quite a large piece of equipment and we're working out how to design it while keeping the solar panels above it at peak performance as well. It's a lot simpler to eject excess heat 
than it is to create it. So it's beneficial in these multifamily passive house buildings that they're cooling load dominated. So the geothermal system is providing for the entire building's heating, cooling, and hot water needs. The other systems for laundry and cooking are using electric resistance. As opposed to other electrification strategies, the reasons why we chose geothermal uh, or ground source, they are used interchangeably, the terms uh, most of the time. Uh, there are many reasons. Um, being next to an elevated train, we have a significant noise pollution to address and avoiding uh, penetrations in the facade is extremely helpful. Uh, ground source system have a higher efficiency than VRF systems in cooling and heating modes. Additionally, we are avoiding long refrigerant runs. And although it has a higher upfront construction cost than other systems at the moment, with incentives such as from Con Ed, it has cost parity or is even better financially. It's a long lasting system and each unit can be in a heating or cooling mode as residents uh, prefer. It also reduces peak loads on the grid because the system's efficiency is not tied to the available heat energy in the air. So its efficiency doesn't fluctuate with the weather as the air source equipment does a bit. One of the aspects of the BOE early design funding helped us support to investigate uh, was a deeper understanding of the potential greenhouse gas emissions savings of the geothermal over a VRF system during the operational phase. Using guidance from ASHRAE's 228 standard, we calculated the approximate greenhouse gas emissions of potential refrigerant leakage from both systems. You can see that the VRF's emissions impact is far greater. If we were to try to offset or zero out this amount of global warming potential gases, we would need about 41,000 mature trees doing their work of absorbing CO2 every year. We also studied the embodied carbon of the geothermal materials themselves. There's not a lot of industry precedent available out there for this as the technology comes from the oil and gas drilling industry. But one way to reduce embodied carbon of the geothermal system is to electrify construction equipment and as like the drilling equipment um, as diesel used during construction is by far the biggest emitter of the system. Some words of caution then when looking to use a system, it requires commitment in early design so the test boreholes can be completed. And even though it's superior in terms of efficiency and upfront cost neutral with incentives, we need to better understand and reduce the embodied carbon impact of the system. Finally, the form factor of your building, such as this one is a bit narrow. So it's crucial to have a low load building and confirm you have enough site area uh, to provide the ground source capacity. To wrap up, uh, let's zoom out again to the larger picture to reach for regenerative architecture. Our Buildings of Excellence early phase study also included how to get to zero carbon, which includes operational and embodied carbon. We created the summary of the typical life cycle phases of our project and all the ways that it can affect or we can currently measure its impact on the planet's greenhouse gas balance. So here's the upfront embodied carbon portion of that chart. And these are the operational and end of life phases. From there, we reviewed several frameworks that outline how to get to carbon neutral or zero carbon. And we chose Living Futures Zero Carbon Framework to study further because it was the most comprehensive at the time, but many more are being developed. So here are the steps it would take to get to zero carbon. Because we have a very efficient all electric building serving a passive house and our solar provides 13% of our electricity needs, we require relatively minimal amounts of renewable energy credits to get to zero carbon uh, and not contribute to the climate crisis. So starting with a baseline of enterprise green communities for an affordable housing project, we estimate that the total construction cost increase is around three to 4% to get to zero carbon. That we believe is a very reasonable goal to pursue in which full electrification plays an integral part. 